<laughs> Hi, Jamin. <laughs> so, what what are you guys here for? Biology class? I didn't even know we were coming here today. Biology class, design cycle, your process. Gotcha. Because everything is a process, right? I thought there was free beer, but apparently only tomorrow. And for adults. Oh, dang it. It doesn't say that. Tomorrow. Hey, it says tomorrow. You know that tomorrow would be tomorrow. All right. I'll um, give you a little little YouTube blurb here, too. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us who you are. I'm Larry Wold. I own a Tail for Tails taxidermy. And this is my studio. And this is the sophomore class at Armour High School. Correct. So, you guys probably want to know how this works a little bit, right? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Well, this is a finished product, almost. This is an elk that's dry. And I've got a date on his antler to let me know when I mounted him because I do a lot of different projects and I don't remember exactly when I finished them before. Um, they need to dry for a few weeks. Once I put the, the uh, tanned hide onto a form or a mannequin, they call it. If you look right back here, these are forms for deer, white-tailed deer. What they are is there a, a representation of what a deer would look like with, with the skin on? It shows the different muscle groups in the neck and the face. And it's made out of foam, so it's nice and lightweight. Um, so when you hang it on the wall, it's not super heavy. And then what I'm doing in the back right now is I'm scuffing up another form that I'm going to mount on a deer later this afternoon. Because if you can feel this, it's got like a, it's slippery. It came out of a mold, so there's a release agent on here so the foam doesn't stick to the mold that, that it's poured into. I have to scuff that up so that my glue will stick between the foam and the leather uh, that I'm going to put over the top of this. It's, um, it's obviously 2015. That isn't the way it's always been done, is it? Uh, it's been done this way probably for about 30 years. Okay. People used to use um, paper mache before we had... Oh, really? foam, petroleum-based um, mannequins. Before that, people used to take a deer, and they'd lay it on the ground, and they'd trace it on a piece of wood, and then they would make ribs around it, just like you'd be making a boat. Have you ever seen when they, when they do ships? Mm -hmm. um, and then they would pack it full of wool or this cotton batting. That's where they kind of came up with the word, I'm going to stuff a deer. Because okay. they used, actually used to stuff the hides. They were kind of round and weird looking because, you know, it would be like a pillow. You know, you can't you stuff something. It doesn't really have a lot of good shape to it. Um, but modern taxidermy, we have professional sculptors who sculpt all these in clay, similar to what I've, what I've done with a, um, a sculpture here that I'm, I turned into bronze. That's a whole other discussion and process, but they they work with clay just like this, but in a, a much larger form, and they sculpt deer of all different sizes, because deer are just like people. You can see right back here, you've got a, a good sized deer and a really big deer. Um, it's kind of like Jamin and Parker. They're both the same age, but some deer are just bigger and some deer are just smaller. Okay, so when I get a deer in and I skin it, I measure the carcass, the part underneath the skin, and when I order a form, like I just showed you guys, I want that to be the exact same size as the, as the carcass was, because when I put the skin back on, I want everything to line back up. Um, when, the, um, when I go to mount the skin, what I'm working with is a tanned hide. And this is a mule deer that I'm going to mount, like I said, later today after I get it prepped. It's, it's now a deer hide turned into leather. You guys can touch this. It's just stretchy, wet leather with hide on it. Um, the reason it's wet is because I need to conform it to all the detail on the form. Um, if I had a like a, a rigid um, Go touch it. leather 
like you'd have on a jacket or a pair of shoes, it wouldn't conform to all the detail that's that's on the form itself. Um, and that's what you're waiting to dry. It's not the glue, or is it the glue both. and a combination of the glue, the clay, the fillers that I have underneath to hold certain things in place. Um, and you don't do your own tanning, right? Do you send that uh, away? Uh, some things I do on small okay. animals, okay. like this raccoon. Right. Um, they're they're easier. I like to have control over it. But big, bulky things like deer and elk and, and buffaloes and whatever else, I send them off in large shipments. I may only do one or two raccoons a year. I don't really send them off with my other stuff because when I skin those out, I kind of want to make a bunch of measurements because they're... They're really uh, finicky when you do a life-size animal as far as fitting back onto the form. Okay. The form has to be exact. It's kind of like if um, if Jamin was going to put on Parker's jacket, it would look it would look like drape all over him. Right. And, and vice versa, if, he, if, if Parker tried to try on Jamin's t-shirt, right, it'd be like jammed into it, and it would look it would look funny. So there's always stitching involved with all the taxidermy, and when you bring that seam back together to stitch it. You don't want to be fighting the stitch, and you don't want to be overlapping. Okay. Um, and, and you want to give the animal credit for, for its size. You know, you want to be accurate. Um, so, yeah, a lot of measurements are taken. Um, a lot of the elk that I get, they're skinned out in the field because they might come from Wyoming or Montana or even the Black Hills. I need to take the tanned hide and lay it out and make measurements of the finished product and then order my forms. Um, it's not as efficient because I like to have the stuff ahead of time, and uh, it, it adds another pro step in the process. But it's just a it's a it's a fact of life. I have to deal with it. Um, I don't I'm not allowed to go on every trip with every hunter right, and right. measure up my own carcasses. But if you shoot a deer around here, I can take it in the back and I can skin it and get the measurements I need, and it's all on an invoice and it's it's quick and and it's um, I like it because I know exactly. When I order those mannequins or the forms, whatever we call them, um, they're going to fit all the time. Sometimes with the elk, I'll kind of measure the skin and I'll put it on there and it'll be a little bit big or a little small. Then I have to uh, mix up foam and either add it or I need to shave it off with a rasp. And that's a lot of work. So You obviously didn't do that. that right the first time? How many times have you screwed up in the history of your life? Um, well, a lot of it I, I may screw up, but it's not really... I screwed up. It's the fact that I I, I wasn't able to be in control of the situation okay. from the beginning. Okay. And then some animals are just they're, they're they're uh, these forms are sculpted by somebody. They're not like molds taken off of oh, they're like not. real elk or real, real deer. It's it's somebody's interpretation of anatomy. Okay. Well, that's where I could say I've screwed up. Is I have okay. ordered from magazines uh -huh. and uh, or not magazines but catalogs. There's a lot of different taxidermy companies. Um, there's two right here, or three. Some guys will sculpt deer that are meant for big Canadian, northern Minnesota deer, even though their measurements are, are similar here and here, the heads might be blockier and the, and the, the, the neck may swell faster than a, than a deer in rut, let's say in Texas or here okay. or whatever. And I've, I've found through trial and error there's certain companies that I go back to, or they have, or they have a line of, of heads um, that I'm, I've, I've had success with. I can look at deer when they get, they bring them in, and I know that these are both the same style of form, but they're by two different sculptors. This is for a big four, five-year-old buck. This is for a three-year-old buck or a buck late in the rut, and when he's gotten atrophetic. And he's running around, and he's chased girls for a month and a half, and he's, he hasn't eaten anything, and he's got all skinny again. So I know, I know by just physically the characteristics of, a, of an animal, when, when somebody brings it in, I know I'm going to either get that line of forms or that line of forms. So biology class, did you know that deer were different in Canada and northern Minnesota than they are in Texas? Is there a pattern? Can we go to a different continent and find the same pattern? Probably What's yeah. the pattern? Deer bigger where? Or colder. In colder places, and they're smaller in warmer, warmer. warmer places. Is Deer that on the equator? How big? Like a Great Dane? <laughs> Not even. They have little brockets deer they have in Mexico, which are actually a, 
and the whitetail family and coos deer that are up into, up into um, like Arizona and the southern and the southern part of or northern part of Mexico, they're maybe ninety pounds. So when we see big goats when we drive to Mitchell, yep, they'd be almost the same. Yes, they're very small. But wow. but looking at them, if you took a picture of one and you you had no point of reference for size, they're physiologically the same deer, but they have a little tiny rack, you know. So, yeah, yep. And in Canada, they have the deer are so big they make the racks look small. In uh, you ever watch the hunting shows like on Jim Shockey? They look at this giant buck, you know, and then they shoot it, and then they walk up to it, and it's like, wow, wow, that thing really was big. Looks like an elk with deer horns. Uh, Gracie's sister, Hannah, she shot this buck right here, and you can see how big that deer is. That deer, when we, when we saw it in the field, it was the same thing. It didn't look that big because the rack looked small almost compared to the body. Well, when we got there, it, it was just like, like it grew, and then the rack really was big, but the body was, it was probably like a 300-pound deer, and I had never seen anything like that. So, are you seeing an increase in the size of deer? Are they getting bigger? Are they getting smaller in South Dakota? Um, the and, deer and, aren't yeah. getting any, any bigger yeah. or smaller, but the hunters are getting smarter and they're being okay. more patient Very cool. uh, through education. Um, there are a lot of wildlife organizations. Um, for instance, we're going to have a, a banquet on Saturday for, uh, for pheasants for, through a group called Pheasant Forever. Um, there's Ducks Unlimited, there's um, uh, Wild Rocky turkeys. Mountain Elk yeah. Foundation, um, Turkey Federation, and there's a group called Quality Deer Management. Well, all of these groups provide education along with, they raise funds for habitat. But um, Quality Deer Management has really helped a lot of people understand, and taxidermists like myself, that show people that a deer... If you let it get to be four years old or three years old, it's rel not a long time. They don't have to be, they're not like 15-year-old animals. You have to wait forever. If a deer is, I'm sure you guys, this is a deer that is a two-and-a-half-year-old deer. Looks pretty good from a distance, but you can see it's not as big as the ones on the wall back there. Um, what we're trying not to do is shoot deer like that, unless you're a kid or it's your first deer. That was Gracie's brother Alex's first year. Um, we're, we're trying to hold off a little bit on, on harvesting our bucks until they're older. Um, I'm seeing a lot more work because a lot of people are not going to normally mount that deer, especially an adult that goes out and, and hunts all the time, um, but they will when they get to be that size. So knowing that you don't really have to wait forever for these things to get to be a trophy size, and we have a, a great genetic base we have good sized whitetail and mule deer in South Dakota. We're, we're really blessed with that. Um, patience, education. Uh, so the deer, yeah, they look like they're getting bigger. Um, I know people are way into doing food plots and supplemental feeding and stuff like that to keep their deer herds healthy. Uh, but most of it is just not harvesting young deer and waiting for a bigger deer. It works great for me because it helps my business. When I started this job, I actually had some state biologists come in and show the hunters through their data, not mine or my opinion, but factual data with, with uh, saving the lower jaws of the deer they harvested. Um, they could show that they could prove the age of the deer, and then they could show them the correlation to the size of the animals. And cool. it worked out really well. A lot of people uh, actually were have really been happy because now they can... They don't. They don't have. They. They're, they're not. They used to think these deer were like eight, nine years old, and they were going downhill. No, they're. They're, they're not. Deer in South Dakota will hardly ever live to see their actual. Um, the lifespan they might have in captivity, because humans, coyotes, weather, it takes a toll on a, on a wild animal. Uh, cars. I mean, they just don't live that long. Bullets. <laughs> But they just, yeah, they just usually won't, they won't go eight or nine years like they, they could in captivity. So. Gracie, do you have a deer in here? No, I don't. Not yet. Not yet. yet. Not yet. Patience. Patience. Well, we have to get her out there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She'll get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Hannah has three deer in here, so. <laughs> um, so, 
I also do uh, birds, small game, big game, large game, uh, fish. Uh, there's different ways of doing fish taxidermy. This isn't even taxidermy, but this is a replica. This is a mold taken off of a real fish, and then we can make several castings. Um, the nice thing about this, I don't have to deal with the skin. Um, I don't have to put it over a form. But you can imagine the paint job uh, is very laborious on something like this. There's a skin mount that's going to be painted. And you can see, even after it's had the skin has been tanned and it's been stuck on a form, it still has a lot of the color in it. I just have to bring that color out with more of a transparent paint job. This is going to require a lot of hand painting and multiple techniques to get this to look like a crappie again. And this is a sunfish, obviously. Um, How do you tan a fish hide? There's chemicals for everything. Yeah, it goes into a, a soak. Stays in there for three, four days. Um, this, the, all the, the the leather that you know, the hides that we, we take off of the mammals. Um, yeah, they go through a, a chemical process, um, two-step process. But yeah, everything is is preservable. Fat is not very preservable. Um, a lot of fish, like the sailfish. A lot of your ocean fish, your salmon, uh, your trout, um, paddlefish, catfish, anything that's got a lot of fat in their skin, you can't really taxidermy traditionally. Well, there goes uh, my it, immortality. Yeah, it just doesn't work for, yeah, doesn't work for a lot of things. Um, so what will happen is the, it may dry, but the stuff will find it, it'll leach out of the skin later, and then it'll, it'll, be, it'll be bad. It just doesn't work. Paint won't stick to it. So... Um, so a lot of uh, trophy ocean fish and salmon and stuff, I do all replicas, so they all start like this. These happen to be uh, two fish that a guy had caught, and he had either eaten them or released them or whatever, and now he wishes he would have had them mounted. So you go we, from a picture then? Yep, yep, picture and measurements. And I've Their got measurements or reality? For those too. What's that? You get reality pictures? I mean, how do you do? You take the measurements from the picture? No. Or do you just trust the guy? The guy, said, the guy when he caught it, he said, I had a 15 and a half inch crappie. Because okay. at the time, you know, everybody measures the fish to tell sure. people what they sure. caught. Um, so, and they add four inches. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, with a, with a replica, you can, I can make a fish whatever size you want because they come awesome. all the way up to like state record size. So, it's up to you. You, you know, to be honest. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Fisherman, honest. <laughs> Same sentence. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. What's your process? You start, you lay it all out, you measure it, and then what do you do? How do you determine what the fish colors are going to be? Because I've seen pictures, and pictures aren't always good. So is it just your expertise? Uh, experience. I've experience? been painting so okay. many of them. I know what, like... 10 colors are going to go into a walleye, but walleyes caught in Canada are different than walleyes caught in the river, which are different than walleyes caught in Lake Erie. Okay. So it's a question I ask, and I, then I ask for pictures. Um, a lot of people that fish are very much in tune with their colors and the bodies of water, and they want their fish to look like where they came from. Okay. Um, some guys, gals, they catch a fish, it's like a once in a lifetime thing. They get this giant trophy. They just want something because everybody said, hey, you need to go mount that. I'm going to get them a, a nice facsimile of what a good, colorful walleye would be, okay. for example. Um, yeah, I'm working off pictures. I'm just okay. People just trust me to make a nice-looking product a lot of times. Um, but I'll tell them if, if I'm going to do a smallmouth bass, I'm going to paint it like a, an excited smallmouth bass that you took out of cold water with the nice barrings on it on the sides. Not like the one you caught in the middle of July that's just a solid green, kind of an ugly fish. Because that's really not what you want on the wall. Okay. And if they're in agreement with that, I make notations on my on my invoice, um, and I go from there. Good question uh, about that, too. When I fill out a, an invoice, somebody comes in and says, I want a coon drinking a glass of wine. It's going in a lodge. It's going in a bar. Okay? Um... I don't do a lot of novelty taxidermy, but it's a raccoon, and they're kind of like a novelty in real life. They're like a little bandito, 
I didn't think it was too bad. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll, I'll draw pictures. I'll make notes. I'll make measurements of the actual raccoon. Because, I, again, I have to put it onto a form, and it has to fit. Um, I have to make measurements so that when I go in to look at my taxidermy catalogs, I can find one that's fairly close in size so that I don't have to make alterations to it because alterations means I get paid more. No one wants to pay any more than they have to. So I want to be um, as close as I can and clear with my clients that if I have to do something like that, there's not a lot of forms that I can get that I can make it into drinking a glass of wine. So um, he required some alteration, obviously, because we were doing something novelty-wise. Um, I take the skin off the hide, uh, off the body, um, I clean it, and then I, 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 I tanned that myself. Um, and then it, the, the hide then gets, uh, after it's tanned, it gets shaved and cleaned, and it'll look like that mule deer hide that I took out of the bag. The, the skin will now be, it'll be white leather, uh, I'll shampoo the hair, make it really clean. All these animals have never, ever been this clean. Um, but that's what you're paying for, a professional looking job. Um, I mean, I want the things to look like they came out of the field, but I don't want to make them look like they came out of the field after they just got done rolling around the mud or fighting, um, unless that's what they want. You know, I have done that for different dioramas and such. But then um, usually what I'll do is I'll take that hide and I'll, I'll put it in the freezer. And then I'll take it out when it comes time for me to work on that project. Uh, I try as hard as I can to work uh, on a schedule, uh, on a calendar. Um, if, if you bring in your, your raccoon in October, it's at the beginning of the hunting season, you'll be one of the first raccoons to be worked on when, I, when it comes time for me to work on raccoons. Okay. If you brought me one in, in December, you're going to be after the guy in October. Um, so you can imagine I have a whole freezer full of pheasants from people. And at the end of the season, I need to take them all out of the freezer and put the ones on the bottom that were on the top because of the last ones that came in, right? So that when I go to work on them, I'm starting from the first ones. So you don't wait any longer than you have to. Um, people ask me, how come it takes a whole year sometimes? Hunting season is like this long in the year. And all of it comes in in a relatively short amount of time, right? I can't mount all that stuff in October and turn it around and get it back to you in November. Unless I have 300 employees that I have for a week and then I fire them all. It doesn't make any sense. So it takes me a year because it takes me a year to get through all the projects. Otherwise, if I, if I have way too much work for me, then I, then I need to add an employee. And if we got more and more, you just, you know, you keep having employees. I have had employees a lot earlier in my other careers. And I just as soon have one. I don't really <laughs> want to have any people work for me right now. Um, so I, I kind of keep my workload uh, where I can realistically get everything back in, in about a year. Some things are quicker, some things are slower. Um, We've been here for 23 minutes. How many times have you thought the word details? And what Mr. Wald is talking about? I have. How many details yeah. have, have you heard about? In 23 minutes. This is why I completely rag on you and say the word details like 5,000 times a year. Because when you grow up, you have to deal with details. If you want to be a business person, you have to deal with lots and lots of details. And that's what uh, I, 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 I bang it into my kid's head as much as I can. Along that line, take notes, use calendars, have schedules so that you don't forget about things, or it wasn't a great idea if you could actually do something really well, not just get it done. Well, if you have a vehicle to help you with the details in life, um, taking notes, putting things on a, on a calendar, um, you can be a lot more efficient. I have to be efficient or I won't make enough money to pay the bills or buy Gracie a new pair of Vans tennis shoes when she wants it. Um, you just I, said that, sorry, Nick. He just said that you have to do a really good job in your planning and your design so that when it comes time to do the work, you can get it done in a shorter amount of time. And I want it to look, I don't want to be rushed. I want it to look good. Um, 
I, I fill out a schedule every week of what's going to come up. Um, I have to know what to order. I have to know um, when people are expecting certain things. I, 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 I communicate with people. All the stuff that's on the wall right now actually is, is going to be delivered in the next uh, week or two as the hunting season opens. Uh, the, like the raccoon is going into a lodge and they're going to start having hunters in uh, October 17th. So I needed to look, look at a calendar and say, Larry, when can you finish this raccoon so it'll be dry and you can give it to them by the 17th of October. Um, had the raccoon in the freezer all year long. They don't want it until the 17th, so I'm not going to mount it and have it in here because they don't want to pay for it either until they're ready to pick it up. So a lot of coordination. Um, I need to know when I'm running out of supplies. I need to know um, when things are, are, are due. So um, details, calendars, schedules, notes, it's really, really important. And then you can enjoy your, your project or your job or your term paper if you're not behind and you're organized. Um, it's just, I can't emphasize I, I, with employees, one of the reasons I didn't like employees is because I had to think for them all the time and it's kind of ridiculous. They're adults, but uh, that's what you do when you're the boss, and you know you're the bottom line. I'm the one that's in charge of them and, and, and uh, making the clients happy. So it's nice now. I can. I'm a little more flexible because I'm the only person here. But at the same time, um, I have to still produce all the stuff that's on the wall and, and organize it and order the stuff and whatever. So um, yep. What if you have like a uh like uh, a thing or a project that comes in and it has to be done by a certain time like do you push some things back or do you just like turn it down I will work with people um, let's say they've uh, they can give me a reasonable amount of time because I I don't like to push anybody to the side or put somebody in front of somebody unless it's like a kid's birthday or you're gonna go and you're gonna be in Afghanistan for a year, I'm gonna work with my schedule. Um, but I have to be careful because adults are just like little kids. If they hear that somebody got pushed ahead of them, they're gonna get pissy. And who knows who they're gonna talk to and what their justifications are. Um, so I try not to do that, but I do, I do. I mean. I'll put some stuff that of my own if I have to go to a, a show, you know, but I'll work extra so that my schedule doesn't get thrown off. So. You are by very definition an entrepreneur. Yes. What would you say to these guys about being one? Don't be one until you have <laughs> a lot of experience um, out in the real world for a while because everybody thinks they're like super smart and they're just going to start a company. You really need to go and, and experience that uh, under the tutelage of somebody else that's, that might be an entrepreneur. Fortunately, all the places I worked for were not corporate jobs. They were all um, self-made individuals that had started their own companies. So I really got to know um, what it's like to have to get sales in the door. Because if you don't have any sales, you can start all the companies you want, but you're not going to get paid. So you have to figure out how to do that. You have to figure out how to make people happy, um, how to work with other employees, uh, you know, get get some experience. If you ever looked in the in the help wanted sections, okay, it'll say um, looking for machinist must have five years plus experience. They don't want to hire somebody right out of school for that particular job because they want someone that they can bring in give them very little instruction, and then they go to work. Other jobs don't want a guy with five years experience because he's going to be expensive. They want somebody right out of college or an intern that they can show you. You know, it's like, you don't know anything about taxidermy? Good, because I don't want you to know anything about taxidermy. I want you to know about what I'm going to show you how to do taxidermy because you're going to work for me. I don't want your head full of a bunch of crap from some other guy or gal. This is the way I'm going to show it to you. So there's, there's always a... Um, a need for different levels, but um, an entrepreneur is cool, but you have to really be open to change, you have to really be open to criticism, um, and you have to deal with it. You can't get crabby with people or whatever else, but that, get, that gets out, 
you always have to be politically correct, even though you don't want to be. Um, yeah, customer is supposed to be always right, um, but you, if they're not, you have to talk them through and explain to them why they're not, so that you don't lose them because you want them to come back and, and use you and uh, you, uh, use the company and, and pay me. So I, I, I don't want to lose anybody. There's certain people I don't care if they come back because they're just a pain in my ass and they're not <laughs> worth the money. Um, but I'm, I'm not rude to them, but I will, I will make them not want to bring their projects here mm -hmm. through either charging them an exorbitant amount of money or getting them so confused that they just never come back. And they have probably had track records with other people, so it's not like, you know, it's a big mystery. Um, um, do you work, like, like, what are some animals that you have, like, like that aren't, like, what you usually do? Like, do you ha have you mounted some like that? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I don't do bisons and I don't do skunks. Can you guess why? Why? Is skunks terrible to work with? Yeah, a skunk could be a disaster, and a bison's just too big and heavy, and I, I don't want to do it. Um, I'll get in some stuff, um, but in the past I had... Let's, let's say you had a, a little weasel or a squirrel or a chipmunk or something. Um, I might actually try and traditionally taxidermy that. Really difficult, time consuming, and when you look at something that's that small and the, the guy says, you want to charge me how much for that? Well, it's time. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. So what I would do, Parker, is I'd look, what's a, what's a better way that I could still give a guy a squirrel mount that I don't have to do it? look for a different tax service that's really into squirrels and does them for cheap. Yeah. Freeze drying services like they do with pets. Pretty cheap. I'm going to do it. Problem solved. Now you can still get your squirrel mount. Um, same thing. I don't know. I want I don't want to do snakes. You know, they're Ew. venomous. Well, they're awesome, you know, I don't want to deal with that. They're really cool. I've done them. But they're really really labor intensive and um, it took a long time. So I I don't want to charge for something like that, I found, found a different source. Um, I like to work on a lot of pheasants and a lot of deer heads. Um, I have a, a very efficient system for those. I have a lot of tools that are designed just to do those. Historically, that's what's going to be 80, 90% of my business anyways. Um, but when I get to doing elk or I get to doing raccoons or whatever else, I'll try and lump them around a time where I kind of get in that mindset, I have those tools out, and I'll do a bunch of that stuff. Um, trying to be efficient. You know, that's that's the biggest thing. If I'm not efficient, um, then I get to charge a lot more money for things that I'm not efficient on, which then means I'm not going to get that work. So, I'm noticing the um, big dog that could eat us all. Yeah, there's a wolf from Alaska and a wolverine from Alaska. Wolverine. And these are pretty rare, and I was pretty happy to, to do this. Uh, I actually spent a little more time with this uh, so that I could take it to some taxidermy shows. Um, but I made that determination and he got a good, really, really good deal on the mount because I, I put extra work into what he was. He was looking for something really basic. And I said, nah, yeah, yeah, I'm going to give you something a lot nicer, but I'm going to pay for the nicer part. You good with that? Oh, of course he is. You know, but I want to have it for a while. No problem. I make those decisions too. Um, I had a, a beautiful oscillated turkey from Mexico. It's like a green turkey, really cool. Um, it was a perfect specimen. Um, I did the same thing. I spent a lot more time on it than what he wanted to pay for. Um, but I, I needed it for my portfolio because I knew I wouldn't probably get another one of those. And now that I've done a really nice one, guess what? He took it home and all of his rich dentist buddies are probably going to be sending me their oscillated turkeys from now on. And they were really, really cool. Um, it's a good feather in my cap as a as a national champion quality tax nurse because now I can say I've done those, and and that kind of gets out there, and you start to uh, attract a little bit higher dollar clients. I'm expanding my business. Lots well, of there's a good example of, as an entrepreneur what what's a smart thing to do. Don't just do it and make it make it as cheap as possible, but spend a little bit of my own time and money to make something with more wow factor that I can take pictures and I can market that now 
and I can expand outside of just pheasants and deer. You know, someday I'd like to do some more stuff on like Africa and whatever else. Not a lot of people around here doing that kind of stuff, but there's people that come up here and pheasant hunt, and if they see some pieces in my shop that are from Africa, and they like it, and they go home and they go, gosh, man, Billy Bob's taxing me down the street from me, does all my African stuff, but he's terrible. That guy up in Armour, South Dakota, he's a national champion. I bet you could probably do my stuff too. I do a lot of stuff like that now. And it's, it's kind of fun. But some of that stuff too is a learning curve too. All the, everything new, I have to get out reference and I have to do a lot of different things and make sure that I'm gonna do a really good job. That's not as efficient as just me mounting a deer like I do over and over and over and over. And a lot of that stuff, I don't wanna do too much of it all at once because I'm, I'm gonna lose some money. I mean, lose because I'm, I'm spending extra time. Um, How many different content areas are you guys hearing here? Finance, economics, history, science, math, English, speech. All of it. Biology. Yeah. Biology. Psychology. Psychology. Yeah, Psychology. Sociology. Sociology. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, a lot of stuff swimming around in my head every day. I think Gracie, she notices that when I come home and I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I'm talking to myself, doing stuff. And, you know, I mean, I'm still kind of winding down, but I don't ever wind down. I think are, I have a little ADD in there. Are deer one of the cheaper things you do just because no. you're so used to it? They're not cheap, Daniel, because I have to buy materials that are more expensive. Uh, the cheapest thing I, I do is probably a, a bird because um, you can imagine a little piece of foam. I'll, I'll grab a body. Um, they just don't pop a lot. No, there's a lot of time involved. Enjoying a bird, but you know, here's a little body for a uh, pintail. It's like six dollars worth of foam. You know, that's sixty-five bucks for one of those. These are one hundred and eighty bucks. So you can imagine, I have to charge according for that a lot of that too. I tan my own bird skin, fifty cents in chemicals. A deer is fifty dollars. So you know you've already got 60, 60, 50, another 18, 20 bucks for the glass eyes, the glue, whatever else. And you get 150 bucks before you know it into that. So I can't really charge less because I can I can do it quickly and efficiently. Um, quickly and efficiently means it still takes two of them. There's a couple there's a, a couple four hours skinning and prepping and doing that stuff. There's a whole day that I'm going to spend mounting you know, the so deer I did it, you did once it, it dries. And then I've got, I've got a few more hours in, in doing the, the finished paintwork. Now, do you notice this is like kind of dry and kind of black looking? Okay. He's ready to be, uh, to start the finish process. This deer is all done. All the little nose pads been put back on his nose. He's been all combed out. Uh, blow him out with the compressor. Get him all clean looking again. And then I go in uh, and I airbrush um, all the different colors. Kind of look like black and dark. There's pink inside the nose, and there's there's actually like three different colors of brown and gray in the nose, and then around the eyes, they're all painted nice, and it's inside the ears. Um, so yeah, it takes a couple of days, so I can I can be efficient, um, but I, and I also have to be competitive with people that are close by that are, I'll call them, you know, similar in quality. Um, I'm going to charge more for a lot of the stuff that I do versus somebody down the road because I don't know any other national champion in tax in anywhere near here. So I'm going to charge more because um, I can. If you want that, you know, a, a good job. You know, like buying a John Deere or buying a, some weird off-brand Korean tractor. You know what I'm saying? You're probably going to get what you pay for. So, yeah. same thing here. Is there anything going on back there? Mm -hmm. I feel like some of that is the most interesting stuff. Well, yeah, we, you guys want to come back here quick? Oh, yeah. Careful. Don't, don't, don't get attacked. Don't get attacked? Yes. You walk. Crazy. Don't say that. There's the spider. <laughs> Oh, 
big spider. Let's say Parker gets a shoots a buck. Okay. Giant buck. He'll he'll bring his deer in the back of a pickup truck or a trailer. We'll back it in here. We'll hoist it out uh, with my winch. We'll have the deer. Um, we can use Paige if you want to winch her up. Yeah. No, I used to do this all the time. Um, we'll put the deer's leg up here. I'll I'll skin off what I need to have, um, and then um, we'll wrap the the half the deer with the, the skin missing back up with plastic, and then we'll put that back in the truck so it's there's no dirt or hair or anything on it. I've already done half the skinning for the guys, so they're pretty happy with that too. Um, they'll be gone. I'll take the hide off the skull, and I will um, what we call turn and split. And we'll, that means we'll, we're taking the lips and the ears and the eyelids and we're uh, opening those up so I can put salt on, on, the, on the hives. Um, this is a salt rack. Uh, there's a big elk on there right now. Um, what we're doing is, is uh, by putting salt on the hide, it pulls the moisture and it kills any bacterial growth. Okay. Um, if we didn't do that, the hide would just rot and the hair would fall out. And we can, obviously that wouldn't work too good for tax then. Um, so this is the first stage after I've, I've skinned the, the deer, or anything for that matter, is I've got it salting and drying, and then um, I'll shake all the salt off, and I will fold it up or roll it up, and this is going to go to a tannery. So this is kind of what the, the hide looks like after it's been, it's been dried for uh, probably about a week. Um, when it's really dry, uh, it'll get like hard as a rock and it'll be really lightweight. And then I can ship it. Um, we want to wait until uh, all my hides are, are kind of ready to go. Then I'll, I'll call a, a shipping company and they'll come over and I'll, I, I've got big crates or boxes full of these and I'll ship them all at once so that I save money. I don't want to ship out like every day one hide. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it as a mass quantity deal. Um, They'll all go to a tannery, and then they'll all come back to hand. So we skin them, we prep them. Um, if you have a, if I've got a bird, mm -hmm. I'll put them in the freezer. Put them in a bag with the wood. So I'll, I'll seal them up in a, in a plastic bag. Um, I, I put them in clear bags so that I can see that I'm not bending any feathers. I'm, trying, I'm real careful with that. And I've got, I've got a, the name, what's in the bag, and the date I shot it. Part of that is for legal reasons. If somebody came and wanted to check my freezers from the DNR, um, I can go and find an invoice that matches up to Cameron Hinckley's wood duck when he shot it. So, wood ducks are pretty. Bir birds go in, and then when I'm ready to do a bird, I thaw them out. I skin them, prepare them. It's all kind of one step. It's not like the deer that it's done in the fall, and then I'm working on it again in the summer when I'm ready to work on it. So it's, it's kind of a different process. These are a lot easier to store. Um, I couldn't freeze a hundred deer. You'd imagine all the freezer space it would take. So. When fall comes, it's kind of hectic for me. Uh, I've, I've been having elk dropped off. I've been having antelope brought in um, while I'm still trying to work on stuff from the previous year. Um, that's a part of the job I, I don't like because I'm kind of organized, and, but that's, that's what you deal with. It's money coming in the door, but you gotta drop what you're working on. This was supposed to be done like last week. But I had a bunch of elk I had to work with. Um, it doesn't affect my schedule any. I just that's when I started on it, and now I'm just getting back to it because I've caught back up. Uh, but part of, part of owning a company or being an entrepreneur is you have to deal with unexpected changes and you have to have a plan. So I I was really close to screwing up 
I had pushed too much stuff out to the very last minute almost so that it would have enough time to dry. Um, and I started getting some stuff in. And I had to go back and work a lot to make sure I got back on schedule. I know you're incredibly artistic and creative and all of those elements. And I know now you're doing bronzes. Yep. So is that you looking for another creative outlet? Yeah. Uh, I, it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, it, it's another potential revenue source. Um, as I get older, um, I'm going to want to have more of those things that sell themselves. You do one original and then a foundry casts reproductions as many as you want. I don't have to do any more work. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but I need to start on those when I'm younger so that people can know my name in the sculpture field as well so that if they like it I'll have enough of those built up over time that when I get older hopefully people will want to buy them I'll become famous or whatever <laughs> as far as that goes It'll be the next Remington already well so yeah it's just it's a different it's just a different thing I enjoy doing it um, but I've done only three of them since 2006. I don't have time, but I, I've tried to make time. Um, I'm really lucky enough to be asked to be one of the artists that represent South Dakota mm -hmm. at the First Lady's Art Showcase, uh, which is in conjunction with the Governor's Pheasant Hunt in October. And they, they ask 500 people to come and listen to an economic development summit in Pierre. And the first lady has an art showcase of the top 30 artists in South Dakota representing different fields, painters, sculptors. I'm the only tax term. Um, so that when they bring in these, these companies or, and people that represent companies and see what South Dakota has to, has to offer, um, they want to show that too. So the push to get the bison done, with, which I have the original clay mm -hmm. out there, um, I wanted to have that done for the show. Otherwise, what's the point? I might as well wait till next year, you know. So I pushed myself to get that done, knowing that I had to have it bronzed. So it has to go through that process, which is totally out of my control. So I called him up and I said, if I want this done by October, how long do you need it? So there again, back to scheduling. You got to know that stuff. And I had to push him. I'm like, hey, Rick, remember, <laughs> October's coming. So, um... And he had to fire some people, and it was it took longer than he thought. But that kind of stuff happens in real life, and so you have to be you have to budget that in. You have to have a little fudge factor, they call that. So, yep, it turned out good, and I'm happy with it. But yeah, it's a, potentially to make more money, and, and be an artistic release. Did so. the working clay come from your previous job? Yeah, yeah. Um, goes back to I I think college. I mean, it, it's it's a fine art process. We didn't do a lot of that in the technical stuff that I used to do as a, as a model maker and a, and a designer. Um, but, you know, we work in so many different mediums. Foam and plaster and I make molds. I mean, it's yeah. So it's just different. Carved wood. Yep, yep. I thought it kind of smelled like beef jerky. Well, his, mm -hmm. Yeah, the new style yes. too, socks and Crocs. Yeah. Boom. New style. I love the shoes. Uh, not really new. <laughs> you hang around me and Parker and his dad. Yeah. <laughs> Has Mr. Walt covered every single part of the design cycle? Probably and more. And more. Think about it. Hasn't he hit every single one of those over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. All those presentations that you guys don't like to do? Doing one right now. Mm -hmm. On the fly. He does on the fly, yep. Every day. Every show he goes to, every person that walks through the door, he's doing a presentation. Yeah, well, a lot of people come in, it's their first time they've ever had anything done. And you kind of have to give them a quick synopsis of what's going on. And then they go, oh, okay, now I see why it costs a lot of money or whatever. Um, I like when people, they always want to do the European gearheads. They think they can just put them in a bucket of bleach or something, and then they go home and I go, 
go ahead and try it. <laughs> they come back next year and they go, well, I totally ruined my deer. I know why it should cost, it should, they think it should cost more now. But, you know, I mean, yeah, people, just, if they don't have a clue, they have to think about it for a while. Oh, they should. You know, so. On the other side of it, those of you who are creative-minded that think you have to become an accountant... You don't. You can pursue that creativity. You can pursue that side of you that... Yeah, there's graphic designers and hairdressers and makeup artists and, um, you know, there's there's all kinds of uh, artistic needs. Don't think you're going to get paid a lot of money because typically artists are terribly underpaid because they're not really generating a lot of money. If you want to go be an investment counselor or a banker or an accountant... Um, you're in the money field, you're going to probably make more money. Um, but money's not everything, uh, but you've got to make enough to, to survive. I know that um, Gracie's brother, he wanted to be like a, in a band, he wanted to do all this <laughs> stuff, um, wanted to be a graphic designer and all this. He, he fixes computers, and he has a job job. And he likes having a job job because he can buy what he wants to buy. Because um, when you get older, you're going to not want to go ask your mom and dad for money all the time. It's just something that you kind of grow out of. You want to be independent. Um, you don't want to ask your mom and dad for everything when you want to buy something for advice. You just, if you have a job, you can do what you want to do. So um, I tell people a lot of exploring your creative side, there's things called hobbies. <laughs> you have a life outside of your job and you can do it without the pressure of having to make money um, I didn't start this company until I was 37 Okay, I had a whole career um, but I knew that I could do this but I did it on the side as a hobby for a long time until I kind of got it down and then it was just a leap of faith to, to start a company and leave my other career cold turkey um, but I really didn't do that. I, I, I phased into it. I was hopefully smart about it. And we got Gracie out of it. Yay. What? I'm moving here. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. What made you want to move And here? Hannah. Because of um, Parker's dad. There you go. Yeah. Um, I, I, I visited here before Parker was born. And I got used to armor. And I like the, the small town. And I like the fact that... Um, it was a good business decision. This is where a lot of taxidermy, there's a high need for it here. Uh, per capita, a lot of people are involved in the outdoors and they, they want something mounted. Uh, it's also uh, a cheaper place to start a business than right inside of or next to a large metropolitan area. Land is cheaper, buildings are cheaper, uh, but I can still charge what somebody might charge as a taxidermist in Sioux Falls because they're all out here hunting anyways. It doesn't really matter. So it made it, it was a better business decision. Uh, you know. But it's a weird field that doesn't rely on just the people in armor. I probably do a handful of things for people in armor. It's all from people out. People that come to South Dakota to shoot pheasants from different... Uh, states, countries, whatever. Um, and then people from all over the state that shoot deer and elk and, you know, whatnot. So. Awesome. Is every rack going to be mounted? Every rack's going to be mounted except for the ones that are up there. Those are going to go on just plaques. Um, I have a spot for them. And I use those as fill-in jobs when, when something maybe didn't go right or I have some extra time. God forbid that ever happens. Um, but they're, they're laid in here pretty much as to the, 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 um, what the, word was, uh, the calendar, the, the time that didn't shot, the consecutive. Um, so yeah, they'll all be mounted at one point. There were a lot more of them and on my pathways done, and I'll get through them. And, but I've got ones coming in, too, so I've got some that are new from this year. Never a new process. That's yes, hope, hope it will be. Mm -hmm. Two months from now, you'll have a bunch more done. Double this many? Oh, two months from now, yeah. I'm hoping that there, there's a lot of new ones, and a lot of these are gone. So, but uh, it's a it's a job where you can't really uh, 
I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how many deer I'm going to get every year. I don't, you know, um, what comes in comes in. It's it's a it's not a real good business plan on paper because I'm relying on your guys' luck. It's kind of crazy, um, but I have to look at um, covering my bases. Okay, I don't just do deer heads. If I just did deer heads, I'd be like, hmm. you know, am I going to get enough deer? So I do elk and fish and birds, and I work with lodges. <coughs> so that hopefully not everything in, all in one year has a bad crop. It's like, okay, Dan, you, you understand this. You have wheat, you have soybeans, you have corn. Okay? Usually have a little bit of everything, maybe some cows. Kind of hedges your bet. If the market's bad in one area, the other area usually picks it up. Usually. So same thing here. Make sure I got a lot of pheasants, make sure I got a lot of deer, make sure I got a lot of elk, um, so that if one's down, hopefully the other one will pick it up. What's your um, one animal that's eluded you so far that you want to mount that you haven't? Oh, probably like, um, um, I like to do some sheep, Shark. like 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 doll sheep or bighorns. Um, they're, they're pretty cool. They're really not that interesting, but they're pretty neat. Um, but I got to do a New Zealand red stag, which is the biggest antlered per size thing. I just, just finished one last week that was gigantic. The wolverine was really cool. Um, the tiger. I've done tigers mm. for the baby ones. No, it was just adorable. But it's so cute. I, I don't know. I, there's some pretty cool birds, I guess, I'd like to mount. I've been fortunate and pretty much mounted every kind of duck that there is. Uh, Albino pheasant? Lots of those. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Cool. I've been pretty fortunate to do some pretty cool stuff. I, I guess some of the African stuff is, would be neat. Um, what about a big old elephant? No, oh. I've done some full-size elk, and <laughs> we're going to probably do a buffalo elephant. this year. Me and a guy from Kimball. Oh, yeah? Yeah. But, you know, that, that's really not fun at all. <laughs> when it's done, yeah, it looks pretty cool, kind of. Kind of. But what's cool to me is if I can do something efficiently and, and get paid yeah. good, um, and I have happy clients, and I have good results. That that really, if I could just do deer heads, and I knew I would be successful and pay all the bills, I'd probably do them because I like to hunt deer. <laughs> and, I, and, they're, and they're really a little different, every one of them, you know. And, and the hunters are so jacked up when they bring them in, and then they pick them up. It's 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 fulfilling, uh, and they do okay. Cool. So if I brought you a king cobra, would you do that? A king cobra, I probably would, just because it's fair enough. Why would Mason have a king cobra? Because I'm gonna go to Africa, hunt down king cobras. Okay, so we're gonna work on our geography a little. <laughs> Wait, whatever. Fine, wherever king cobras live, whatever. I'm gonna go stab it and bring it back to Larry. Like, yo, dog, not this for me. Yo, dog. Yo, dog, not it for me. Yo, what? What's the biggest rat? Oh, I, I, that, that, oh, that, that red deer from New Zealand was, it was 470. And a really big elk might be 340, 350. That's really. a huge. Yeah, it was freaking big. And I've done like, um, you know, moose and stuff before, but that was just, you know, it's on a, it's on an animal that's not a lot bigger than a mule deer. It's like it's a small elk. Really, it's just like. Ah, gigantic. Yeah. What's this? That's a badger. Uh, well, thank you for asking no, that. Why is he so messed up? What, what, what I got going on here is the um, I. The guy wants it standing and has his, wants to show the claws. So I, what I had to do is I had to make some modifications. Um, and what I did was I cut things and moved them. And then I just um, I dribbled in some foam uh, to fill in the voids of where I cut because um, I'm making alterations to it. His mouth cup, they call it, um, it's got the teeth and the tongue and all that stuff. That's going to be inserted in here right before I get ready to mouth it. But what I can do now is, since I've taken this, um, this foam and, I, and I've added it into the little hole, all I need to do is just, is just sand it back down smooth again. And um, 
you know, there it is, it filled in the hole. I'll, re I'll reshape all this stuff and make it look like his, his ankle and his wrist and whatever else. Do you but, use clay for that as well? Yeah, I use clay for some of that, but yeah, I like to try and uh, put the foam back in here because the foam acts as a binder. Mm -hmm. I cut this off from here and I kind of glue it together and then it acts as a filler and a binder all in one. I'm glad you asked what it was because it kind of, to me it kind of looked like a frog and a cat put together. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mad science. The, you know, the thing with these with these mannequins is you can kind of see some of the muscle group just because it's, it's kind of built in here. But unless it was a real carcass with, with ligaments and tendons and, and, and red groups of muscle, you know, and whatever else, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. I mean, they've got some of that sculpted in here to represent a big vein that's up in their face. But like with this, um, with this badger, I mean, there's so many things going on with this guy if this was the actual carcass. But when just smooth foam, they don't get too carried away with a lot of the finer details with this. His hair is going to be that long. Why, you, just, you just need to have it it's proportioned correctly. And um, and it's anatomically correct. Very cool. And, and, and whatever. And they come in all different sizes too. So, yeah. Any other questions for the um, genius over here? Any last minute questions. Last minute questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's raining. I wondered about that. Uh, no, it's just so many birds and squirrels up this yeah. candle. Well, it, it might not be raining hardly at all, but this is one big fiberglass tin so roof, so it. it sounds sure. like it's mm -hmm. hailing. <laughs> All right, sophomores, what do you say to our world-renowned taxidermist? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Not can we drive back? No. Ah. We have one vehicle. Well, You're not going to melt. I'm, I'm the witch melt. here. I'll melt. I'm well, going for it. Yeah, we're witches. <laughs> You do you do really good work, Larry. Really good work. And this is like the, this would be the stinkiest part of the ah. shop, yeah. right here. So it's pretty good. I, that's another thing too about uh, if you're gonna own a company, you need to carry yourself really professionally. This could be a disaster. In a lot of shops, it is. It's a lot of shops you walk through, and they have stuff like this out with your. Finished, and that's just that is not a good combination, because people come in and they're going to get an impression. Mm -hmm. Impression, first impressions. That's another thing. <clears throat> touching that really quick too. First impressions are huge. When you walk in, what did you see? You saw finished pieces, trophies, stuff like that. And Lit what did you smell? Nothing. A little. I got a little candle thing. Yeah. I touched my feminine side. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've never. I've been in here a lot. I've never ever smelled. And if I dead. get something in, like I had an elk that I just did a European mount, and it had been, it had been dead for a, a week. Mm -hmm. It did not smell good, but I had to, I had to deal with it. I had to get it done, yeah. clean it, and then air the shop out as fast as possible because you never know when someone's going to come in the door, mm -hmm. and they're going to go, "Oh my God, that guy's place was terrible." It's like death. It's never like that, but it happens, and I have to kind of hurry up and. Deal with it. Have you ever had to re repair a mount? Lots like, of times. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. That fish that's out there, um, that's an older mount from somebody that I'm I'm fixing and then repainting. Um, I fix antlers on tines that are broken. Um, I do repairs on fish. A lot of stuff like an old deer like like that, you can't repair it. Uh, what I would do is I would I would tear it apart and pull the, the antlers out of it, okay. and I'd remount it from scratch. With a, with a new cape, new mannequin, it'd be awesome. But that, but that came with the building, and that's cool. <laughs> the ears look funky. Oh, a lot of stuff looks funky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing's <laughs> funky. Right there. Yeah. Awesome. So, yep. All right. All right, people. We're going to get you back. Yep. We can also see my dad, see what he's up to. Yeah. Well, involving those dead people. people. He does the same thing, just with people. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, that's... Uh, well, it's true. Yes. Well, not really, because he, he doesn't was, skin them. He doesn't, he doesn't skin them, them. them but... Yeah. Someone has to do it. Not that we are aware of.
I really like this place. Really? I like the way you made that. Bye, Larry.